Okay, so last week for our first class, we're having some technical difficulties, and I couldn't get documents to open up from Blackboard or from our network. But I did want to, to pull out here the assignment schedule and just go over that quickly. You can see here from last week, we had the four pages, the, the four topics we covered. This week, we'll have a couple of more topics. Um, we actually have to go back. We didn't get through decimals last week, so we have to double back to that a little bit before we're done today. But you'll notice that next week in week three is scheduled exam one. So next week, there will be our first exam. That'll be in the first hour of class. Um, hopefully, we get everybody done in the first hour or so, and by 11.30, we can start our lecture on new material. So just make sure you're ready for that. At the end of class today, if there's a little bit of time, I'll go over what's going to be on that exam for you just so you can prepare. And remember, there will be part of that exam that you cannot use the calculator on, just so you know. Also, you'll notice if you look at the assignment schedule, there's only 15 weeks scheduled. That's because normally we only end up with 15 Fridays in the semester because of scheduling. Um, a quirk this semester gave us 16 weeks. So unless something comes up and I happen to miss a, a week or something happens, um, what we'll probably do is we'll add that extra week in Unit 3 here. Unit 3 is the dosage calculations. That's where you guys really need the most work anyway. So we will uh, add that time in there. We'll make that from three weeks into four weeks. Like I said, that is assuming we don't lose a week somewhere along the line to some unforeseen event. <coughs> okay, with that, were there any questions on the homework that we assigned from last week? Anything that you want me to go over? Okay then, well, let's start out then with some new material. So the topic we didn't get to last week was our decimals. We talked about our place values a little bit on the front side of the decimal point. And rather than writing them out in words, I'm just going to put the numbers up. Here. This is the ones place, the tens, the hundreds, the one thousands, the ten thousands, the hundred thousands, and so on. One millions. And we can keep going. What you will notice here I, mean, I may have mentioned last week, math is about patterns. And when you start to see patterns, everything else makes more sense. So if you may have noticed here, the pattern being every time you move one spot to the right, that place value is divided by 10. Or vice versa. If you go one spot to the left, the place value is multiplied by 10. Again, one spot to the right, you divide by 10. And it continues down here. One spot to the right, you divide by 10. So if we were to keep going with our place values, one spot to the right again, divide by 10. Well, what's 1 divided by 10? 1 tenth. Divide by 10 again, 1 one hundredth, 1 one thousandth, and 1 ten thousandth, and so on. The reason I point this out is a lot of people always ask, why is there a ones place here and no once place on the other side? It's because of that pattern. You have to divide by 10 at every position. So there's a ones place on the left side of the decimal, but on the right side we start at tens and then hundred or tenths, hundreds, thousands. Now again, that'll be important for rounding. Um, we'll look at rounding in a little bit when we do a little bit of basic division. But other than that, we're not going to get into too much of naming our decimals except for converting decimals into fractions. If I have 0 0.048, and I want to turn that into a fraction, well, first, how would we read that number? Well, we would read it as 48. Yes? Okay. So anyway, 0 0.048 would be pronounced as 48 tenths, hundredths, thousandths. We name the place value of the last digit in the decimal. Now the only reason we need to know that is when we go to write a decimal as a fraction, it's going to write this 48 thousandths, 48 over a thousand. So we're going to write it exactly how we say it. That place value of the last digit becomes the denominator of our fraction. Decimals are just a way of writing a common fraction with a Denominator is a power of 10. 
Now, of course, we wouldn't leave it as 48 over 1,000. What would we do to it? We can reduce it by... What can both those be divided by? Well, they're both even, so we know they can be divided by 2. Let's do that. It gives us 24 over 500. Now what? Well, we're still both even, if you're stumped. So you get 12 over 250. Are we done? We've got at least one more because they're still both even. Dividing by 2. 6 over 125, and that is as far as we can go. I'll only do one more example just because I want to show you this. How does having the number in front of the decimal point affect how we would convert this into a fraction? Well, just like in our fractions, if we had something like 7 and 3 fourths, we had a mixed number, and we had, a, we had the mixed number, we had the whole number and the fraction. The same happens here. This is a mixed number. We have a whole number, and then remember, this is a decimal, but it really represents a fraction. So the 19 isn't going to change. It's the 0 .0875 that we are going to convert into a fraction, and that's going to be 875 ten thousandths. Good. Two ways to look at that. This is the tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths is the place value of that last digit. A little shortcut to double check, by the way. There's one, two, three, four decimal places. There better be one, two, three, four zeros in that denominator. One, two, three decimal places. One, two, three zeros in that denominator. Now, of course, this can be reduced. Anybody want to venture a guess? 5, 25. If we do 25, what do we get? Be 400 on bottom, I'll give you that. 100, no. 175. It's 35, you're right. 35 on top. Are we done? No. What can they both be reduced by? Still by a 5. So 7 over 80. Are we all done then? Say no. What am I still missing? 19. I have the whole number yet. That is 19 and 7 80ths. So make sure we don't lose that. Okay, enough of that. Just a quick little review of our operations with decimals then, and we'll move on. If I need to add something like 23.64 and... 9.829. When I set this up, what do I have to be careful to do? To line up the decimal points. Very good. And again, as we mentioned last time, that's because we can only combine things that have the same name. I can only combine tenths with other tenths, and ones with other ones, and hundredths with other hundredths. Lining up the decimal point, just make sure I'm lining those up with each other. Technically, I should put a zero in here just to fill that in. And I'll go ahead and add. And when I'm adding, the decimal point does not affect anything. It gives me one little thing I have to do, but it doesn't affect my carrying. It won't affect borrowing or anything else. So zero and nine make nine. Four and two, six. Six and eight, 14. So it's four, carry the one. Again, it doesn't matter if there's a decimal point there. I carry the 1 right past it. Just ignore it. But before I can do the 1, 3, and 9, I need to bring the decimal point down. Why do we bring the decimal point straight down? Well, because it's lined up, yeah. But when we are adding numbers, we keep the same name. So the tenths have to stay tenths. Bringing the decimal point straight down keeps those tenths. The ones have to stay ones. Bringing the decimal point down keeps those ones, and so on. So now we have 1, 3, and 9 make 13. So we keep the 3, carry the 1, and 1 and 2 is 3.
Let's get some traction. So here again, just like with addition, we have to make sure we line up the decimal point. Just like in addition, we're going to fill in that zero to fill that place. And now we'll subtract. Zero minus six, of course, can't be done. We need to borrow. So the three becomes a two, and this becomes ten. Now ten minus six, four. 2 minus 7, we'll have to borrow again. And again, the decimal point doesn't affect anything. We just borrow like we normally would. 12 minus 7, 5. Just like addition, we bring that decimal point straight down. We'll borrow here, 3 and 16. 16 minus 9 is 7. 3 minus 1 is 2. Very good. Um, one other example I do want to show you subtraction. Just be safe. Something like this. First of all, when I go to set this up, where is the decimal point on the 8? At the end of the number. If it's not written, it's always at the end. So we still line up our decimal points. And we'll fill in those missing zeros. This time we have to have four of them to fill that up. When we go to subtract, 0 minus 3 can't be done, so we need to borrow. But there's nothing here to borrow from, so what do we do? We keep going until we hit something we can borrow from. In this case, that'd be the 8. So we borrow, that's a 7. That makes this a 10. However, we don't need it here. We need it all the way down here. So we just keep going. Borrow from the 10, that's a 9. This is a 10. Borrow again, 9, 10. One more time. Borrow, that's a 9. That's a 10. Now we can subtract. 10 minus 7 is, or 10 minus 3 is 7. 9 minus 9, 0. 9 minus 8, 1. 9 minus 7, 2. Decimal point straight down. 7 minus 2 is 5. Multiplication. Four point seven three times five point eight. Do I need to line up the decimal point? No. no, I don't. When I multiply, I do not need the same name. I'm going to ignore the decimal point completely while I multiply, and I'm going to multiply this just like I would whole numbers. So eight times three is twenty-four. So four carry the two. Eight times seven, fifty-six plus two. 58, so 8, carry the 5. 8 times 4, 32, plus the 5, 37, and we'll carry over the 3. Now, just like with whole numbers, when we move over to the next digit, we got to put a 0 here. I also put a line up. Yes? Again? Okay, give me just a second. Okay, so we got the 0 in there. Now we can move over to the 5. 5 times 3 is 15, so 5, carry the 1. I always put that line across there so I know that that's a new carry and not from the last digit we were working with. 5 times 7, 35 plus 1, 36, so 6, carry the 3. 5 times 4, 20, and 3. So now we just add the columns, 4. 13, so we carry the 1, 14, carry the 1, 7, 2. Where's my decimal point have to go? 3 over. 3 over. We got 1, 2, 3 total decimal places in the problem. 1, 2, 3 total decimal places in the answer. So it's between the 7 and the 4 there. The other way to look at this, when we did whole numbers, we talked about estimation. Well, this is about 5. This is about 6. 5 times 6 is about 30. We're expecting our answer to be close to 30. 2.7 wouldn't make sense. 274 wouldn't make sense. 27.434 is the only spot for that decimal point that makes any sense for us. 
Division with decimals, I'm just going to do one quick example, and then we'll move on. I want you to divide this to the nearest thousand. Now, believe it or not, there is a way to divide by decimals. If we went back to that version of division that we saw on the first day where we did, you know, the, the place values and multiplied them out and subtracted and all that, that, um, that actually is the same process we would use to divide decimals. But through the years, we've tried to shorten things up, and we've saw a process for dividing decimals that's much different. In fact, what most of us have been taught for dividing by decimals is to not divide by decimals. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, we get rid of the decimals and the number we're dividing by. So here we're dividing by the 3.8. We get rid of that decimal. And how do we do it? Well, we move it over. Move it over one spot. Get it to the end of the number. But if we move that decimal point one spot, what do we have to do? Move this one over one spot. So this is now 743.76 divided by 3.38. Why are we allowed to do that? Well, because we, we mentioned this before, a fraction is a division problem, and a division problem can be thought of as a fraction. We can think of this as 74.376 over 3.8. And we've already seen with fractions that we can multiply the top and bottom by the same number. So if I want to get rid of the decimal point on bottom, I just multiply by 10 to make it 38. I have to multiply the top by 10 as well to make that 743. So anyway, once we've done that, we'll divide just like any other division. Does 38 go into 7? No. So we leave it blank above the 7. 74. Yes. How many times? Only once. We subtract. We get 36. Bring down the 3. Does 38 go into 363? Might go in there 9 times. That would give us, what, 342, I believe? 21 left over? Does that look great? Okay. Now what? Bring down. Yeah, very good. I was waiting for somebody to say bring down the 7, but before we bring down the 7, we have to move the decimal point up. Now we bring down the 7. 38 goes into 217. Five times? Five times eight is 40, because 15, 19, 190. So this is 27 left over. And then bring down the six. 38 into 276. Let's try seven times. With 10 left over. Are we all done now? Well, I said I wanted it to the nearest thousandth. We're not to the thousandths place yet. But we can just add a zero here and bring it down. We already have the decimal point. If there wasn't a decimal point, we'd have to put in a decimal point before we added the zero. But we can keep tacking those zeros on the end for as long as we want to. So now it's 38 into 100. Probably twice. 76 into 24. Now are we done? We're at the thousandths place. Why not? Why are we not done? Because it's the thousandths place, but we don't know whether it's going to stay that number, it's going to stay a two, or if we're going to have to round up to three. So we need to go one more digit. Put in one more zero and bring it down. 38 into 240 is 6. That'd be 228. 228, yeah. How about, is it, I don't know why I put the 6 there. Let me get this straight. Is 6, 6 times 38 is 228. With 12 left over. Little hamster is already on the weekend already. 
So now that 6 tells us that to the nearest thousandth, we have to round that 2 up to a 3. So this would be 19.573. Any questions? Okay. Well, our next step then, um, we'll start with our new That kind of finishes up everything that we didn't get done with last week. Um, we're going to move on now. Um, just because of the time left in the first hour, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to our Roman numerals and we'll come back to percents in the second hour. So in the medical field, the medical field is one of the few fields that still actually uses a lot of Roman numerals. Uh, the two that I'm familiar with, the medical field and publishing, still use Roman numerals. All the Roman numeral system is, is a way of using symbols other than digits to represent numbers. It's what we call an additive system. Our system is a place value system where the location of the digit um, determines what its value is. You know, a 9 can be a 9 or, in this case, it's 90, depending on where it's located in the number. In the Roman numeral system, the symbol itself has a value. The only, the only thing that position will change is whether it's added or subtracted. So let's take a look, first of all, at what the symbols are. For one, the symbol is I. Now, I was always taught when I was in school that Roman numerals were always capital letters. The um, main reason for that was back then there was limitations on your type fonts. So some of your small letters could be um, confused with numbers and other letters. So they used the capital letters, so they were easily distinguished. Now it is acceptable to use small letters, so either a capital I or a little i for one. The next one would be five, which is represented by a V. Ten is represented by X. L is, or L, 50 is represented by L. 100 is represented by C. That's what they call it a C note for a hundred dollar bill. From there we go to 500 which is D and a thousand which is M. And from there they use bars and lines to indicate like 5,000 would be a V with a bar over it. That means you're just taking that times a thousand. Um, 10,000 would be an X with a bar over it and, and stuff like that. For our purposes, we don't need to go that high. There is a symbol beyond what I learned when I was younger that, that's used quite a bit in the medical field, and that is the symbol for one half. And that is two small s's together. It means one half. So anyway, if I want to build a number in the Roman numeral system, if I want to build the number three, I just put together three ones. Like I said, it's additive. So it's I, I, I. One, two, three. But in the, new, in the Roman system, they decided they did not want more than three of the same symbol in a row. So to do four, it is not I, I, I. They don't allow that. They didn't want to do that because it's too repetitive. So what they did was they set up a subtraction system. To represent 6, they do 5 and 1. VI represents 6. The, the uh, 1 coming after the 5 is added together. To subtract, they put the smaller symbol in front of the larger symbol. So to do the 4... They put the I in front of the V. So if, since the, the I stands for 1 and the V stands for 5, I is the smaller symbol. So with the smaller symbol in front of the larger symbol, it is subtracted. This one means 5 plus 1, or 6. This one means 5 minus 1, or 4. So anytime there's a smaller symbol in front of a larger symbol, it is being subtracted. So,
XXVII would stand for what? Oh. Yeah, XX is 20, 5, and 2, so it is 27. Very good. How about XCVIV? Well, what's the X stand for again? 10. 10. What's C stand for? 100. So we have a smaller symbol in front of a larger symbol. Those two are going to combine to be 90. The V is okay. So that's a 5. But then we've got an I and another V. A 1 in front of a 5, which is 4. So that combines to make 99. Technically, we usually wouldn't write it that way, by the way. There's a more efficient way to writing it. Generally, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a more efficient way of writing it. Of course, just like that. XC is still 90. IX is 1 from 10 would be 9. Same thing. How about this one? ISS. That is one and one half. Good. XIV. This is 10 and this is 4. So 10 plus 4 is 14. Let's go the other direction. In publishing, Roman numerals are used for uh, expressing the year. So let's say I want to express the year 2015. What symbol is it for 1,000 again? M. So M and M is the 2,000. No hundreds. There's a 10, so I'm going to put in an X. And for 5, it's going to be V. So MMXV is 2,000 and 15. Anybody want to throw their birth year out there and we'll do that one? I'm not going to. But. How about for the sake of argument, we say you're born in 1993. How would we express that? So we've got the 1,000 here. That's going to be M. 900 is represented by doing what? What, yeah, 100 from the 1,000, right? So it would be CM. Um, you see this actually in a lot of, uh, of movies you watch at the beginning when they have the trademark, like the, the lion or the, the, was it the pyramid, the stars around the mountain. You'll see that on the bottom. MCM Studios is 1,900. The nine, the nine for the 90 is... XC, then of course 3 is I, I, I. So that's 1993. I want you guys to convert for me. Four thousand three hundred eighty-nine. Convert that into Roman numerals for me, quick. To do this, the four thousand we cannot do M M M M because we're only allowed to have three of the same symbol in a row. So we would have to have the symbol for five thousand and subtract one thousand from it. I'll be fair this time. Well, technically, what this would be. Um, 5,000 would be a V with a line over it, or a line under it, depending on what version you're in. And an M in front of it. Yeah. But I didn't force you guys to do the, the thousands multiplier. You did it anyway just for fun? Yeah. yeah. How about 3,924? That one's fair. This one can actually be done, I promise. So, 3,000 is going to be 
MMM, 900. CM, good. That's just 100 away from 1,000. 20? XX. XX. And IE for the 4. IV, sorry, for the 4. Um, as you can see, going from the, the, the English standard numerals to the Roman numerals is fairly simple. You can go just digit by digit. Going in the other direction is a little more difficult, as we saw. I want you to do XIVSS quick. Convert that into standard numerals. So going this direction, we can't just go digit by digit. We have to add them up. The X stands for 10. The IV has to go together. It's 4. And then the SS, 1 half. So that is 14 and 1 half. What do you think? Good stuff? Okay. It's a few minutes early for our break. Let's take our break right now. We'll come back, it is 11.13, we'll come back at 11.23 and we'll start our second half.